Hello, and welcome back. I hope that your memory is feeling good, and you've had a chance to memorize those letters and numbers from the major system. What sound goes with four? R, right? What sounds go with one? T or D, right? T or D. How about the other way? What number goes with sh? Six. What number goes with b? Nine. If this isn't easy yet, or if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you might want to pause the video and do a little more studying. I won't know if you have them memorized or not, of course, but I think you'll get a whole lot more out of these next few minutes of this session if you've mastered the major system links. For the moment, I'll presume that you have. Let's talk about how you can use these tools to encode groups of numbers. The basic idea of the system is that you take two or more numbers, we'll start easily here with groups of two, and convert them into the consonant sounds of the major system. Then you add in as many vowels and other non-major system sounds as you'd like to convert those sounds into words. Once you have words, you convert them into a meaningful and hopefully memorable image. When the time comes to remember the numbers that you have encoded, you just recall that image you've created and decode it back into numbers. Let's give it a try. Say you want to remember the number 56542911. Now, you could repeat it to yourself over and over again. Memory scientists call this rehearsal. 56542911, 56542911. You could do this over and over again, but if you're ever interrupted or distracted, you'll likely lose it. Even if I just say a few numbers, 7, 2, 8, 3, 6, 23, that, that's probably enough to disrupt your rehearsal long enough that that original number is gone. If you encode the number using the major system, however, you can remember this number forever. Okay, so first let's break this number into pairs of two digits. 5, 6, 5, 4, 2, 9, and 1, 1. In the major system, 5-6 corresponds to the sound, the sounds O and sh or ch, so L and then sh or ch. I'm going to go with L and sh. Within this system now, you're allowed to intersperse vowels into these phonetic sounds and then make up words. L and sh for me becomes lash. Could be something else for you. There are a lot of words you could make up here, but lash is the one that comes to mind for me. In general, you're going to want to use whatever that first word is that comes to mind. So I can clearly imagine eyelashes here. For our next two digits, 5, 4, the major system gives us L, R. For me, I think of leer, as in someone leering at another person. 2, 9 converts into N, P. I think of nap there, someone taking a nap. Finally, 1, 1 turns into T, T. That makes me think of tot, as in a, a, a tater tot. Okay, so all together then, our number 56542911 is lash, leer, nap, tot. So we could try to encode these words individually as, as particular images. But given the relatively small amount of information here, the best thing to do is try to group these four terms into a single coherent image, image that we can think about. For lash, I think of someone with very, very long eyelashes. This person, this long lash person, is leering at a second person. That second person is taking a nap. And the napping person is holding a, a giant tater tot, kind of like a teddy bear. Now, I really want to remember this image. So it's important that I spend a few seconds really vividly imagining it. I can see the odd curl of those very long eyelashes and the really creepy looking eyes of this lash man as he's leering at the unsuspecting nap man. I feel some of the uncomfortable emotion that one might have while watching this scene in real life. The nap man is wearing checked flannel pajamas. He looks very cozy in his bed there. He's oblivious to this creepy leering man. The grease from the freshly cooked tater tot is getting all over everything. 
making a mess of the pillow and causing the napping man's cheeks to get shiny. Okay, so that's a pretty memorable, very detailed image for me. I think that I'll, that I'll have that in mind for a long time, probably years. Whenever I want that number back, all I need to do is call that image back and unpack it into the digits again. So lash, leer, nap, tot. That's the image that I have in mind there. L-S-H, and L-R, and N-P, and finally T-T, which in turn becomes five, six, five, four, two, nine, one, one. Voila, perfect recall. My guess is that this process makes sense to you, but it probably doesn't feel very easy just yet. Coming up with words and combining them into memorable images while needing to recall those number consonant connections over and over again probably feels quite hard, actually. You'll have to trust me for the moment that this will fade with practice. In particular, those number consonant relations, those will become second nature. The number eight will just come to feel like f or v. Three will just be m for you. You'll also get better and better at generating those images and then decoding them back into numbers. It's just practice. As you go through your day today, I would urge you to try that practice. When you read numbers on street signs, try to generate sounds, then words, and then images. Then decode back to the number. The speed limit on some road on your drive is 45 miles per hour. That's RL, a roll of paper, maybe a, a rail on a staircase. A gallon of milk costs 376. That's M, and then K or G, or sh, ch, next. I'm tempted to say mugshot, but it has a t at the end, so I might add one to the end by accident. I think mug, then shoe, is going to work for me here. I could imagine a mug of hot liquid being poured into a fancy shoe. Now, these practice things aren't, aren't necessarily things that you'll actually try to remember in the future, although you may find that you do. I'm suggesting these things as practice to do until that major system becomes very comfortable and second nature, ideally. At that point, you'll be able to focus not on those links, but on the information that you actually do want to remember. Again, you should be prepared to find this challenging at first. But within a few hours, I think you'll notice it getting very easy. And once you have it down, it's like riding a bike. That is, it will stay easy and just get easier and easier with additional practice. So that's the major system. For the remainder of this session, I want to tell you about another system called the method of loci. Eventually, we'll come back to discuss how the major system and the method of loci can work together in a really powerful way. I'll then spend a little time pondering why the method of loci works. What is it about our brains and our species history that's led to this? We'll finish this session with a discussion about the capacity limits of your long-term memory, or rather the seeming lack of any limit to it. This, this complex network of hundreds of millions of neurons and many trillions of synaptic connections, it's really a marvel in terms of memory. Don't worry about wasting space with the many trivial little examples that I give you in this course. There will be plenty of space left for memories that you actually want to encode there in the future. Okay, the method of loci is this other memory system. It's like the major system. It, it takes information that you want to remember and encodes it into a format that your brain is especially good at using. Unlike the major system, however, there's surprisingly little you need to do to learn this one. The method of loci is something that you almost get for free. The invention of the method of loci is credited to a Greek poet named Simonides, who lived around 500 BC. He was commissioned to write and perform a lyric poem about a great military victory and the general wonderfulness of the leaders involved. Simonides recited this lyric poem at the dinner, but afterwards he was called outside the building on some urgent business. During those few minutes that he was outside, the entire structure collapsed, killing everyone inside. The collapse was catastrophic, with giant slabs and columns of marble falling all around. 
Not only were the people killed, they were pulverized beyond recognition. The party was so large, there were so many people there, that it wasn't even clear who had been in attendance. Grief-stricken families arrived in the following hours, fearing the worst and wanting to at least claim the remains of their loved ones. But no one knew exactly who had been where. Simonides, in that moment, invented what's become a staple of modern memory science, something called the method of loci. He walked through the wreckage of this great hall where the dinner had taken place. Among the rubble were all of the dead bodies and shattered remains of the grand tables and chairs where he'd recited his poetry just several hours earlier. As he recalled his lyric poem, Walking Through the Hall, which, of course, he had recited from memory, he walked through um, at least what was left of the hall, remembering who had been sitting near him as he recited particular lines of that poem. According to the story, Simonides was able to remember the names and seating locations of every single person who'd been at the party. Now, if someone had just asked Simonides to list all of the people he could remember, just off the top of his head, he would have remembered some, but not all of them. Somehow, placing himself in the locations where he had been, when he encoded the information, made it all come easily to mind. This is an interesting story, but it's far from clear that the events ever actually took place, let alone that Simonides was accurate in his naming of all of these people who'd been at the party. However, this method of loci is one of the simplest and most effective tricks for memorizing things that's ever been discovered. Whatever it is you want to remember, a list of Supreme Court justices, a shopping list, a to-do list, even a sequence of numbers, if you can tie that information to known physical locations, then your memory for it will be dramatically improved. Dramatically improved relative to if you simply try to recall it without those spatial associations. Let's try it out. I'm going to talk you through a list of items that I need to buy at the grocery store and describe how you could use them to memorize that grocery list. Now, we don't have a Greek hall made of marble to use to store our memories like Simonides, but you don't need one. Any familiar path through a familiar space with definable locations in it will work. Sometimes memory experts call these buildings their memory palaces. By the end of this course, I'll be urging you to develop several of them for your everyday use. For me, my first memory palace was the house in which I grew up, in Media, Pennsylvania. The path, I remember, starts at the end of my parents' driveway, then progresses to the top of the driveway, where a, a slate walkway begins. Next is the, um, at the end of that slate pathway, outside the front door, then just inside the front door. Next is the start of the hallway, then my bedroom, then the linen closet across the hallway, then my sister's room, and my parents' room, then the bathroom. My, my list of locations actually goes on and on, but that's more than we'll need for this particular shopping list demonstration. Okay, the list I want to remember is apples, tomatoes, dishwashing soap, toilet paper, dish detergent, milk, and orange juice. Let's encode that list in our memories. One of the first things to note about memory is that simply repeating the list over and over won't really help me. It will work as long as I keep doing it over and over, but if I'm ever distracted for a few minutes, or in some cases even a few seconds, some item on the list may drop out and be lost. To remember the list, I have to make it meaningful. I have to connect it with other things that I already know. In this case, I will connect the images of these items on my list with my memory for these locations in my old house. Okay, apples. So I could just imagine an apple sitting at the end of the driveway at that first location along my memory path, but that's not especially memorable. I want to imagine something salient, something striking. Recall that the same was true for encoding numbers using that major system. For apples, I'm going to imagine a giant basket of giant red apples, big apples. I'm imagining them as vividly as I can here. They're bright red, they have flecks of yellow and green near their giant stems. You can smell those giant apples. 
can imagine their smooth, cold texture, and the rough texture of the unfinished wood that makes up the apple basket. There it is, sitting at the end of my parents' driveway, right next to the lamppost and the grass that probably needs to be mowed soon. It's a very hot day in my memory palace. I can feel the asphalt give a little under my feet. The more vivid and striking and detailed your memory image is, the more likely it is to stick, to be memorable. Okay, apples are done. What's next? Tomatoes. I move on to the next location in my memory palace. That's the top of the driveway, at the start of the slate walking path. I'm going to imagine a large steel tub filled with tomatoes. And someone is stomping on them in their bare feet. Julia Roberts is stomping on them. She's smiling and saying, remember tomatoes. I can hear the sound of the squishing tomatoes. This is very distinct. That's good. The, the tomatoes are well encoded. Okay, on to the next stop along the memory path, outside the front door, and dishwashing soap. Jeff Goldblum is standing there. Not sure why. He's uh, balancing some white porcelain dishes on his head, very precariously, while holding one plastic bottle of dish soap in each hand, and, and one in his mouth. These are strange images. I'm producing some unusual images here, but that's on purpose. Strange, unexpected, even bizarre images are the most memorable. They're the most likely to produce accurate recall in the future, when I want it. Okay, now I'm at the next location inside the front door of the house, and I want to remember toilet paper. These 80s celebrities are uh, on my mind for some reason today because now Madonna is dancing around. She's singing Lucky Star while wearing clothing made entirely of toilet paper. She's also holding a roll of toilet paper in each hand. Welcome to my subconscious, everyone. Sorry, it's kind of messy in here. These images are not only unusual. Uh, in order for these techniques to be most effective, you should try to generate images that are really striking, even a little racy. Okay, now back to our shopping list. The next stop on my memory path here is my old bedroom. I need to encode dish detergent. I hope I don't conf get confused with that dish soap here. So I'm, I'm going to imagine a dishwasher running very loudly while sitting there in the middle of my bedroom. The water is being pumped out of the machine, but there's no drain. It's just my bedroom, so it's making a very big mess. On top of that machine is a large box of powdered Colgate dish detergent. I'm not sure if I'll buy that brand, but it'll be enough to trigger the item on the list for me. Okay, I think one more location will suffice here. I have two items left, but I'm gonna try to group them together. I leave my room, I open the linen closet across the hall, and there is Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, still with the 80s celebrities. Tom is holding a carton of orange juice, and Meg, a uh, gallon jug of milk. Tom says he likes orange juice in the morning. Meg says she likes milk in the afternoon. She says, you've got milk, like the movie title, You've Got Mail. Okay, so have you got the list? To recall it, pretty much at any time in the future, I just have to take this imagined walk from my driveway to the linen closet. There's the giant apple baskets. There's Julia Roberts crushing the tomatoes. Jeff is still balancing the plates while holding the dish soap. Madonna's inside with the toilet paper. In my room is that uh, dish detergent. And across the hall in the linen closet are Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan with orange juice and milk. This method of loci works. You need to do a, a bit of work. You have to engage in some effort to memorize a list. But something about this method of memorizing is remarkably effective. You really should try this for yourself, certainly after the end of this session, but it might even be good to pause the session now just to give it a shot. First, the first thing you want to do is develop your list of locations. I recommend using your childhood home or your current house if you've lived there for many years. You may actually want to walk through a particular set of locations physically if you can, and certainly you want to imagine them vividly. For the list itself that you want to encode with this, create striking images and place them, those events, within your memory palace. Take the time to imagine them in detail, and voila, they will stick. Why should this work? Why does our memory work well if we imagine events happening in locations? In a sense, it seems like it should be harder, since we have to encode not only the shopping list, 
but the list of locations and people, all the other objects, all the weird things they're saying, you're encoding more information, a lot more, not less. Why should the recall be easier? The best answer that modern science can give us comes from evolutionary psychology. Remember, during most of the history of our species, humans have made their living hunting and gathering. Our brains are very good at remembering locations and things associated with them. You get this ability for free. You were born with it, without having to do much of anything to earn it. All you need to do to improve your memory is use this great mental tool that you have. By associating information that you're not very good at remembering, when considered by itself anyway, with information that you are good at remembering, you get a boost in performance, a big boost. As I've mentioned, one of the primary themes of this course is to teach you to remember things better. Hopefully I've convinced you already that you have a great memory at your disposal. All you need to do to remember better is convert things that are hard to remember into those things that are easy to remember, things like images and locations. When you want to recall those things, the images will come back to you easily, and you can decode them back into the information that you want to have available. Let's talk just for a few moments about how you might combine the major system and the method of loci together. Eventually, once you're very familiar with both of them, you can try that yourself. Given how new they probably are to you, you're likely to find that quite challenging at this point. With practice, however, the two are very easy to combine. For now, let me just describe how they can be used together. There have been performers, actually they're still out there, who've made their living as mnemonists, as super memory experts. Many of them are, are still out there performing feats of memory as, say, one part of a magic show. A common trick is to memorize a very large string of random numbers. Before listening to this course, you might have been impressed if someone looked at a page full of numbers, say, 64 random digits and memorize them perfectly within a minute or so. It might have seemed almost magic to you, like something that would require photographic memory or some other very special innate ability. Hopefully it's become clear to you that you yourself could do that very trick. Using the major system, I've just shown you how you can memorize eight digits and remember them with perfect recall, essentially forever. Imagine next that I place that eight digit image, so for us remember that was the uh, long lash leering man watching the guy nap with the tater tot. So imagine that event is taking place at the first location in my memory palace, there at the end of my parents' driveway. For the next eight digits, I walk up to the next location of my memory palace and memorize the next eight digits. If I continue doing this to the eighth location, I'll only really have eight things stored in my memory, these eight events in these eight locations but I'll then be able to unpack them at any time that I want into those 64 digits. Memorizing numbers can be a useful skill. Uh, once you've mastered this, for instance, you won't ever forget a phone number again. Want to remember the birth dates of your friends, their anniversaries, no problem. That said, my reason for telling you about this is mostly to begin the process of explaining how human memory functions. This is pretty impressive stuff, memorizing 64 digits in a few minutes. It's also remarkably unimpressive in a way. Until now, you might have watched someone who could look at a piece of paper and memorize 64 numbers and been very impressed. If the person stated to you very confidently that they have photographic memory, you might have believed them. How else could someone encode something so quickly, so massive, if their brain couldn't just take a picture that they could look at later? Expert mnemonists, however, consistently say that their memories are no better than those of others. What they practice is a skill, one that's associated with knowledge and effort, but not with any unique or even relatively rare mental ability. We all know people who have excellent memories. They remember dates, places, the answers to trivia questions. They remember what times and places that events are scheduled to take place. They never have trouble remembering where they parked their car in the giant shopping multiplex parking lot. They remember phone numbers, even your phone number. They meet someone once, have a brief conversation with them, and then recognize them and remember their name when they see them months later. Some of these people may claim that they have a photographic memory. 
Most just indicate that they simply recall things well. All of them enjoy something really wonderful and useful. The ability to have large amounts of accurate, detailed information available to them on a moment's notice. Information they can use to guide their behaviors, to make better decisions. Information, that, information they can use to identify relations between different pieces of information that others might miss. In this course, I'll present a wide range of evidence that your memory can function just as well as those people, with those people with seemingly photographic memories. Indeed, I'll argue that there is no such thing as a photographic memory, based on evidence collected by dozens of different memory research labs. What makes some people's memory so much better than others? I'll present, that, I'll present evidence that it's not what you have up here in your head that makes memory different. It's how you use it. One of the most compelling sources of evidence for these claims comes from studying these memory experts, people who make a hobby out of challenging themselves to perform great feats of memory and recall. Some of the most impressive mental athletes you can find in the United States compete at the USA National Memory Championships each year. They participate in a competition that includes several different memory challenges. My favorite memory championships event is speed cards. Competitors are handed a deck of freshly shuffled cards and asked to memorize their exact order. They're timed while they study. The watch stops when the competitor says, ready, and sets down that first deck. The next thing they have to do to get credit for this time is rearrange another deck to perfectly match the order of the first deck. The record here, one minute and three seconds. Perfect recall of the order of 52 cards in only 63 seconds. Records like this are impressive, and it should be noted that there are a lot of people who are just a few seconds behind it. Do these mental athletes possess some special innate gift? Do they have photographic memories? The performance of these athletes is undoubtedly impressive, but the most interesting thing for me, and people who study memory, is what they say when you ask them about their memories. Essentially, all of them will profess to not having any particular special ability. None of them claims to have been born with some um, special ability to remember things well. They possess no latent superpower that emerges in their early teens or anything like that. Quite to the contrary, most of these mental athletes make a point of saying that they have no more innate memory ability than, than anybody. What makes them so good at encoding and recalling information is how they use their memory. They work very hard to develop memory systems and then practice using them, but it's not what they have in terms of memory that counts, it's how they use it. When someone does set a world record for, say, number memory, one of those mental athletes at uh, the USA Memory Championships, for instance, they essentially never chalk it up to the discovery of a special genetically endowed ability. Usually what they've done is invented and mastered a new and better system for encoding numbers. For instance, when we use the major system, we encoded groups of two numbers into letters and then words. A real expert in this would be able to encode groups of three numbers into words. For instance, if I have three, five, and one, that turns into M-L-T, which could be a, a malt or a mallet. If they can think up an image with four words, just like we did, they would have 12 numbers instead of just, just eight. If they have 12 numbers in each of eight locations, they'd have a string of 96 digits in their minds. A great deal of research has been done on how human memory functions. There's still many compelling theories and a lot of unanswered questions, but two relevant things are very clear in this domain. The first is that there is no such thing as a truly photographic memory. That's just not how the brain functions. There have been many claims of photographic memory and some truly impressive demonstrations presented to support those claims. But essentially every time there have been careful studies of people claiming to have photographic memory, it's been found that their memory exhibits all of the same operating strengths and limitations that govern us all. To be clear, there are people who have much better memory performance than others, but it's not because of a magical and mysterious brain power which with, which, with which they've been born. Another thing that's very clear in this domain is that the things that provide certain individuals with better memory performance than others can be learned. People with better memory performance do a better job of encoding 
storing and then recalling information. If you learn to do a better job of encoding, storing, and recalling information, then your memory performance can be improved as well. If you learn to encode, store, and recall information at a world-class level, then indeed you will produce world-class memory performance. That's a surprising fact to most people. Those individuals with a great memory don't have a fundamentally better or even different brain. They don't have any great mental power that a typical person doesn't have. What they do in order to achieve their great memory performance is to make better use of the capacities that they do have. Now I can tell you about these techniques, I've already been doing that actually, these tricks, if you will, are things that are, I can describe, but you should know that they all require practice. As with any course, you should be prepared to do your homework on this one. If you just watch these sessions straight through to the end, you'll learn a lot about human memory but you won't possess a fundamentally better memory when you wake up tomorrow. In these first two sessions, we've talked a lot about the overarching characteristics of human memory, the sorts of things that memory is good at and the things it's not so good at. I've described that memory works by encoding things in a meaningful way, not as an unprocessed photograph. We've talked about the essentially limitless capacity of our long-term memory presuming that we manage to get things meaningly, meaningfully encoded into that long-term memory. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the memory power you can gain by converting difficult-to-remember information into easy-to-remember formats. In our next session, I want to start to talk more about the specific characteristics, the, the subcomponents that produce our memory. I'll start by talking about a few brain-injured patients who've lost their memories. By better understanding amnesia, we can better understand how normal memory functions and ultimately use it better. One of the greatest memory difficulties for many people, include myself here, is remembering the names of people we meet. I'll illustrate the value of enhancing encoding of that to describe some solutions to this difficulty. So if you want to remember many more names much more easily and learn some things about how your brain functions, I hope you'll watch our next session. I'll see you then.